Director of Quality Assurance at the National Reference Laboratory in Abu Dhabi. His educational background includes a bachelor's degree in clinical laboratory sciences from the University of Illinois at Chicago in 2001, and also has an MBA in healthcare management from the University of Phoenix in 2005. Mr. Ibrahim then spent the first years of his career working in several hospitals in Chicago and Florida areas. In 2008, Faisal moved to Egypt, where his assistance helped two laboratories become the country's uh, first recipients of CAP accreditation. Quite an achievement. Soon after, in 2009, Faisal joined the U.S. National Institute of Health as a QA, QC technical advisor. In 2010, the American Society for Clinical Pathologists International, the ASCP, appointed Faisal to be their lead ambassador to the Middle East and Africa to raise awareness of the uh, international certification. In 2011, he was contracted by the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute, CLSI, as international program manager, and his roles with CLSI included teaching quality management systems and providing mentorship to laboratories in this region. Uh, his topic today is managing quality and accreditation in a large laboratory network. Thank you, Faisal. Thank you, Carlo, for the introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, today, I'll be talking about managing quality and accreditation in a large laboratory network. This is a very challenging and complicated topic. I know you're either facing the same challenge in your laboratory now, or you'll be facing it very soon. We are all aware of what's happening in our industry in terms of consolidation and acquisition of lab services. That only leads to further challenges when it comes to quality and accreditation. We all know it's hard enough to keep high quality standards in one laboratory, so imagine when dealing with multiple laboratories. And not only multiple laboratories in the same city, but in different cities with different regulation. And with that, welcome to my life. So what I'm gonna be talking about I'll be comparing and contrasting the College of American Pathologists standard against its ISO standard because I'm directing quality in a number of laboratories in uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Elaine. So I'll be sharing the experience with you. I'll describe to you the inspection preparation process. I will discuss the requirement such as audit, proficiency testing, scope of accreditation. I'll share with you some of the quality control practices. And accreditation to us is just the beginning. Quality is a long journey, so we're gonna talk what we are gonna do beyond accreditation. <clears throat> First of all, welcome to Dubai, the land of wonders. We have the tallest building in the world. We have the biggest fountain dancing fountain, the largest man-made marina. And the ladies will like this. We have the largest shopping mall by area. So it is the land of wonders. We have a lot of wonders in Dubai. And in the clinical lab, we are no different. Last year, we became the largest College of American Pathologists accredited referral laboratory network in the Middle East. Last year alone in our network, we were able to accredit five laboratories by ISO 15189. We were able to accredit two initial accreditation by the College of American Pathologists, in addition to one re-accreditation inspection in which we were visited by 10 inspectors. Total number of inspectors who visited our laboratory were 35. So in average, six inspectors visited each one of our laboratories. So that was an important milestone in our journey, worth celebrating, and we did. And I think you guessed it now, it's in the atmosphere over here. We always like to be number one, and we even like to compete with ourselves. Number one sometimes is not enough if you relax, so we have to improve and we have to become better and better. So for 2017, we added three laboratories to our network, two in uh, Abu Dhabi, 
and one in Dubai. And the plan is by Q3 of this year, we're gonna accredit all those three laboratories by both CAB and ISO. In addition to being in compliance with both CAB and ISO, we have to be in compliance with the local regulation, such as Dubai Health Authority, the Health Authority of Abu Dhabi, in addition to the local inspections of uh, OSHAD, which is a safety inspection, that's a two days inspection uh, with the requirement much more stringent than both ISO and CAB. We like to plan our year uh, ahead of time. So for next year, we're gonna have many inspections in, uh, and we expect to be visited by 48 different inspectors. So with such a large number of inspection and inspector, something as simple as inspection logistics can be complicated if we did not plan it right. So I will share with you how we prepare our logistics because I know if you have one laboratory, logistics might not be an issue. But if you're gonna have 12, 14 inspection per year, this is something worth uh, thinking about. When it comes to CAP, College of American Pathologists, we always start our communication somewhere around four months before the inspection. We communicate with the CAP office in Chicago, and then they will communicate with the regional commissioner. The regional commissioner will find a team leader. After finding the team leader, the team leader will identify inspection team. Then for us, we have to know the nationalities, the passport, to assist them with the visa. So this for CAP. When it comes to ISO in the other side, we communicate somewhere around six months before an inspection because we need to submit our quality manual and sample of our SOPs in addition to many other documents for the ISO. For ISO, there is no need for visa assistance. Usually Dubai accreditation take care of the visa and the airfare. For CAP, we have to take care of the airfare for the inspectors. Hotel accommodation is required by both CAB and ISO. Ground transportation in the inspection day is required by both CAB and ISO. Number six is a little bit different. CAB, we have to pay for uh, accreditation fees. For ISO, there's a daily charges per inspector per day. We advise laboratories at the initial inspection, we take one laboratory on a time in our network. But for the re-accreditation inspection, we will do a system inspection because that will save us uh, time and money. Just, I'll share with you some numbers. <clears throat> CAP accredited more than 7,000 laboratories. More than 6,000 of them are in the US. We do appreciate the CAP because they have an outstanding standards. ISO 15189. Uh, according to ILAC, there's more than 2,200 accredited ISO laboratories around the world. In terms of checklists, CAB have the team leader checklist, the general checklist, and the all common checklist, which are the equivalent of the management requirement of ISO. In addition to that, there are many discipline specific checklists, which are the equivalent of the technical requirement. CAB update their checklist annually, so in our laboratory, in January of every year, our quality assurance team meet to discuss the new changes to the checklist, and then we will list what we need to do in terms of our policies, and sometimes we add the changes to even our com to our competency assessment program. In terms of ISO, in average, we notice that ISO update their standard every five years. We have ISO 2007, ISO 2012, and we're expecting ISO 2017 to come soon. In terms of inspection cycle, CAP visit us every two years. The year in which we don't have inspection, we do perform self-inspection. And what we do usually, we ask our Dubai lab to inspect our Abu Dhabi lab, Abu Dhabi lab to inspect our Al Ain lab, and so on. So we try to rotate our staff so that they can learn from each other. And as always, we try to standardize our policies whenever possible. All of our technical uh, policies will be a little bit different, but our general policies are the same across the board. For ISO, they visit us every three years, but the year in which there is no ISO inspection, they usually come and do surveillance inspection. 
The surveillance inspection is almost as detailed as the real inspection. In terms of number of inspectors, we have many mid-sized laboratories. So in average for CAP, we had about six inspectors. For ISO, usually we have two to three inspectors, but sometimes they spend two to three days in our laboratories. The inspection team for CAP, usually they are from a similar sized laboratory and from a similar activity menu. They are volunteer, so we appreciate the CAP inspector spending time in our laboratory and sharing their knowledge, and they also learn from our system. For ISO, we have full-time inspectors. So the inspection team who come to visit our laboratory is divided into two. We have technical assessors and management assessor. The management assessor, many times they are not laboratory professionals, but they are very familiar with the quality management system. The technical assessor, a lot of time they have lab background, so they come and inspect our technical component. And we are using Dubai accreditation, but of course it's a regional. So CAP, you deal directly with CAP. But for ISO, the, you have to deal with regional um, accreditation agencies, such as Dubai accreditation. If you are in Turkey, you deal with TURCAC. If you are in India, you um, communicate with Naval, and if you are in the Gulf area, you can communicate with Gulf accreditation. In terms of a scope of accreditation, the CAP will, in, will uh, only accredit your entire scope. So you cannot do part of your activity menu. For ISO, you have the option of accrediting part of your activity menu, so you can accredit your hematology and chemistry department only, and as you go, you can add more and more. For our laboratories, we accredit the entire scope. And we think that in the near future, the insurance reimbursement will be tied with the uh, scope of your accredited tests. In terms of proficiency testing, we are enrolled with the CAP PT program. <clears throat> because there are more than 20,000 laboratories around the world enrolled with the CAP PT program. And there's a lot to compare when it comes to peer comparison. For ISO, we also enroll with the CAP PT program because that will be sufficient as well. According to the ISO standard, uh, as long as you are enrolled with uh, an approved PT program by ISO 17043, that will be sufficient. Last year, the CAP accredited their PT program by ISO 17043. Well, let's look at the rule of average. If I ask you where you're from, I don't think you can tell me, well, my mother is from Ras Al Khema, and my father from Abu Dhabi, so in average, I'm from Dubai. Well, the same, it doesn't work in the QC practices. So ISO and CAP, there's a little bit differences. So for ISO, as per ISO 5621, ISO state that the lab shall design QC procedures that verify the attainment of the intended quality results. Um, you need to define your quality requirement, the frequency of testing, and then you need to follow that. The local accreditation or the ISO uh, regional accreditation, Dubai accreditation, have more stringent requirement, especially in the area of clinical chemistry. In addition to that, they expect us to calculate the sigma level, which I'll be talking about toward the end of the presentation. For CAP, we need to follow at least the default CLIA regulation, which is state that we need to run at least two levels of quality control every day. We, you, you used to have the option of doing EQC, but by January 1st, 2016, you should not do equivalent quality control. The only option for you is to do IQCP, which stands for Individualized Quality Control uh, Program. Or some, li some people like to call it Individualized Quality Control Panic, because many people are panicking of this new requirement. Uh, I'll, I have a couple of slides to discuss the IQCP, Individualized Quality Control Plan. But of course, this is a lot of information that need a full um, presentation. So IQCP is divided into three components, risk assessment, quality control plan, and quality assessment. 
The Ferris component is the more complicated because it's new to us. It's new to the laboratory industry in terms of knowledge and background. Risk assessment. I know that many of you are doing the quality control plan already and quality assurance, basically what your supervisor is doing at the end of every month in terms of reviewing the quality control, reviewing the equipment maintenance, temperature, etc. So I, I just gonna cover in one slide the risk assessment part. So the risk assessment as per uh, CLSI EP23 evaluation protocol 23, which was published in 2011, uh, is divided into five components, specimen, environment, reagent, test system, and testing personnel. Um, in 2013, CMS, which stands for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, released a circular stating that all laboratories need to start uh, the education period in 2015, 2014, 2015 to learn about IQCP, and by 2016, they need to implement IQCP. And to implement IQCP, the first thing you wanna do is risk assessment and in the five areas. So I, I just gonna go over maybe one of them, reagents. If you look into lot-to-lot -lot validation, and I ask you, how do you do lot-to-lot -lot validation in your laboratory? I have seen, visit, I visited many laboratories in the region, and I have seen five different practices. The first type of labs, they don't even believe in lot-to-lot -lot validation. Maybe they never heard about the matrix effect. Second type of labs, or the second type of laboratories, they will do it, but they will forget to define the acceptable difference. The third type of labs, they will do the lot to lot validation, but they will say 10% uh, as a difference is acceptable across the board. I don't think a 10% difference in a sodium will be a good idea. The fourth type of laboratories, they, use the, they usually use the total allowable error, which is acceptable by CAP. Or you can even do the lot to lot validation based on certain concentration, maybe a sodium of 140, maybe for cholesterol you can run a low, normal, high, and so on. So we always encourage that you understand how you can do your lot to lot validation. So this is just one example of you looking into one of the components, one of those five components, which is recommended by EP23, and try to assess the risk, mitigate the risk, and put enough quality control to detect any failure in your system. In terms of our quality manual, we went back to the uh, document which was released by the WHO and CLSI um, back in 2013. We used it as a template. This is a free document available in the WHO website, and we, we, we download it, we read it, we modify it to fit our laboratory. For this year, last month, CLSI released QMS 25, Handbook for Developing Laboratory Quality Manual. We read it already, and in our next revision, which is due in April, we will be, we'll be looking into this document and we'll try to utilize it to further improve our quality manual. The structure of our quality manual is very much similar to what is recommended by CLSI in terms of introduction, hours of operation, legal entity, mission, and vision. However, the area in red, we did it a little bit differently. In the document by CLSI, it was recommended to be done by quality system essentials, maybe organization, document management, personnel, and so on. But for us, we decided to do a crosswalk between the ISO standard and our policies and our procedure. So in our quality manual, we address the policies and we list a sample of the procedures. And we did it for two reasons. Number one, it helped us, uh, or it helped our staff understand the requirement as per ISO, and then they can really handle the inspection well and understand our laboratory. The second reason is sustainability. Regar regardless of who's working in the lab, they can pick up the manual and they can understand our quality. For CAP, they would like to see the quality management policies, which is um, your quality control policies, your test method validation, in instrument maintenance, proficiency testing, and so on. So instead of developing two different set of policies and procedure for CAP and ISO, 
we created separate policies uh, related to the quality management and we cross-referenced it into the quality manual and that was sufficient for both CAB and ISO. The inspection process, we handled it um, a little bit. Um, the, some of the inspection requirements are a little bit different when it comes to specimen collection manual. Both CAB and ISO have the same requirement. However, for ISO, they would like to see the specimen stability. So they would like to know how long your specimen is stable for if you would like to repeat test or to reorder any test. Many times the inspector will ask you to rerun samples. And for CAB, you need to set up a meeting with your CEO and CMO. For ISO, it is sufficient that the inspector can, can meet with the lab director and with the quality team. Also, most of the ISO question, or at least more than 50% of them, get answered by the quality assurance department. For CAB, most of the question get answered by your, techno by your technologist. In terms of deficiencies, CAB have phase one and phase two. Phase two are more serious and they require a lot of correct, uh, require a lot of paperwork in terms of proving to the CAB that now you are in compliance. Phase one is less serious. Uh, in terms of um, ISO, they will have non-conformance report, NCR, if it's related to patient care observation if it's a process improvement, and then recommendation. In our network, if we get cited in one lab, we address the citation in that lab, but then we address it across the board because we don't want to get the same citation in our next on-site inspection for the other lab. In terms of calibration requirement, it's a little bit also different between CAB and ISO. ISO expect us to uh, enroll or to um, contract with an ISO 17025 certified external calibration laboratory. So this lab need to come and calibrate our uh, thermometers, our incubators, our centrifuges, and then they will provide us with the report. For CAB, there is no preference as long as accuracy of the equipment is verified at defined interval. In terms of ISO also, that report which the vendor will provide us, they want to make sure that our supervisors understand this. So we ask the vendors to come and train our staff on their report, and we want to make sure that our supervisor signed this report when it's completed. In the inspection summation, the inspection process is almost the same. But in the closing summation, when it comes to ISO inspection, we always like to discuss the corrective action plan with the inspectors. Because when you submit your corrective action plan to Dubai accreditation or to ISO, they will forward your corrective action plan to the same inspector who inspected your laboratory. So agreeing with the inspector during the on-site inspection in the corrective action is always advisable because they are the one who have the final decision. In CAB, it's a little bit different. Your corrective action will be sent to the Chicago office and they will be looking at it and then they will decide if your corrective action is sufficient or if you need more documentation. In terms of corrective action, the final corrective action should be submitted within 60 days for first time inspection and 30 days for renewal inspection. For CAP, the final corrective action is supposed to be submitted within 30 days. As we finish with the accreditation process, I always share the logo guideline, the use of logo guideline for both CAP and ISO with our team with our IT, with our marketing, to make sure that we are in compliance with the logo guideline because they are a little bit different. In terms of audit, you want to make sure that you have a certified internal auditors. One advice I would like you to use is to download the slip -to checklist, stepwise laboratory quality improvement toward accreditation. This is also a free document available in the, in the website. The latest version was released in 2015. And what it did, many people don't understand the ISO standard. The language might not be too easy. So what, uh, how this document created, they, they, they changed the standard into a question and answer format, and they organized it by quality system essential. So it will make your inspection process even quantifiable. I like many parts of this checklist, especially the evaluation and audit and the purchasing and inventory. Generally, I like the ISO in terms of the non-technical department. So this is well covered in the, in the quality process. I use the slip to checklist in many countries in Africa, more than 10 countries. 
and I did use it in three of the caucus countries, and they found it very helpful. And I encourage you, again, to use it in your laboratory because this is part of the internal audit requirement as per ISO. Beyond accreditation, accreditation, as I mentioned, quality is a long journey. Accreditation is just one stepping stone. We have to continue improving our laboratory. For our laboratory staff, they are the most valuable resource we have. We always support them in terms of improving their competency. Anybody who takes the American Society for Clinical Pathology examination and pass it, we reimburse their examination fees. 44% of our technical staff are certified by the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Why did we choose the ASCP? Because it is the most recognized and influential leader in the field of certification. More than 500,000 professionals uh, in, in over 27 categories received this certification since 1930. The fact that our staff are working in a CAB accredited laboratory will qualify them to have more access to examination specialties. We were recognized by the ASCB Board of Certification for having one of the, most, the highest number of ASCB certified laboratory professionals in the UAE. Um, I, this is a picture, I took it last week from our laboratory. I just want to show with you some of the process improvement activity we have done. So this is our lab. When the SAMU reach our laboratory, we feed it um, into the, this system and it will sort it. It will automatically centrifuge the tubes and then it will go to, the, to this area where there is an image capture. It will take an image of the tube and it will scan the barcode to know the test which is ordered. And then the image capture will know the quantity of the sample. It will check for hemolysis, icteric lipemia. If there is a send out, it will automatically aliquot the sample. It will seal it. And then based on the test, the sample will go into our analytical part. It will automatically go into different devices or instruments to be tested. And then when the testing is completed, it will come to this area where it will automatically be recapped and then it will automatically be storage in the refrigerator over here. So a lot of automation, very minimal um, intervention by our laboratory staff. At the analytic part of testing, we always check our sigma level at least twice a year. And we compare our um, PT performance against our um, results, and we calculate the bias, and then based on this, we have a formula to calculate the signal level. Managing quality versus watching quality. If you look at only your data every six months, and you have a nice um, pictures or diagrams or uh, images in your uh, board, this is not sufficient. We like to improve onto this. So what we do, we, the, we are uh, planning to calculate the moving average. We are considering doing QC bracketing, which is running QC before and after. Any test that we are at a lower sigma level, we will try to put more control in place to make sure that we detect the problem before um, the results are released. At the post-analytic phase, we do auto-verification. Auto-verification is a process when the results come out of the analyzer, it will automatically go to the system, and based on certain limit, the results will be automatically released. Almost 95% of our results get automatically released. Only 5% of our results get looked at by our technologists. So we really encourage everybody who never used auto-verification to consider using auto-verification. For 2016, our auto-verification ranges are a little, a little bit wider than the normal ranges. For 2017, we're going to go a little bit uh, bigger in terms of the limits. So we're going to look into even getting closer to the AMR, but of course, based on the test result, based on the clinical significance, and so on. Why many laboratories don't go for auto-verification? Uh, this survey was done by the AACC, and they said, a lot of labs said they just didn't have time to do auto-verification. I, I really encourage you to look into auto-verification because it will really help you streamline your process. It will help you have a standardized result across your network. 
my last slide, I think, about our staff. They are the most valuable resource that we have. We take these pictures usually after every inspection. And all other departments, and every two years we rotate them. And it's a win-win solution. It's a win for them, because they know that the longer they stay with us, the more they learn, the more they develop. It's a win for us, because we have a sustainable system. We don't have to worry about turnover. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen in the inspection day. Because we know whoever is working in that bench can handle any inspector and any inspection. With that lovely pictures, with all those smiles, thank you all for listening and have a good night. Thank you very much, Faisal, for making uh, the accreditation topic interesting, which is not easy. And I especially enjoyed your comparisons between uh, CAP and ISO 15189. You'll have an opportunity later to um, ask Mr. Faisal questions related to this topic.